and welcome to another episode of Conversations with Alice and Jay, The Journey to Hear. I'm your host, Alice and Jay. Today we have with us Dr. Nicole Cannon. Dr. Nicole is the President and CEO of Black Mental Wellness Corps. She's passionate about mental health awareness, treatment and reducing mental health stigma, especially that which relates to the Black communities. Both her clinical and research interests have continually focused on mental health issues specific to the Black community and identifying ways to address the cultural and systemic issues that impact Black mental health and wellness. This passion is what led her to develop the Black Mental Wellness Organization. Dr. Nicole Kamek, thank you so much for joining us on Conversations with Alison J, The Journey to Here. Welcome, Dr. Nicole. Black Mental Health. And you guys were one of the first that came up. Oh, good. Yeah, and I just thought, okay. So I started to look and research because one of the things I'm very passionate about, and not because it's now the big buzz fashion thing, Mm -hmm. let me just put that out there, because back in 2001, this is when I had the realization of this. In 2001, I was dating someone who I didn't know when we first started dating. He actually has um, manic depression, what they now call bipolar disorder. Mm -hmm. He was hospitalized twice. He had two um, psychotic breaks. Mm -hmm. So I've seen the manic and I've seen the depressed. I've seen both sides of this thing. And when he was hospitalized, he obviously went to visit and so on. And I was thinking, how, now if you imagine this 2001, I'm trying to remember how old I was in 2001. Okay, early 30s. <laughs> so, and, but yet, there were so many black people in there. Yeah. Young black people in there. And I'm thinking, this is not like it's a predominantly black neighborhood. Mm-hmm. So why then are the numbers of black people in this place yeah. proportionate to every other ethnicity that's when it dawned on me in 2001 Mm. right and over the years i've never seen it get any better so now that i'm looking at studies and i've written a couple of books and i was looking at um one of them is because i i'm because i'm a coach and one of them is it's just bite-sized inspiration but i didn't want it to be too woman or female centric Mm -hmm. i wanted men to be able to pick this up and get some practical tips. So I started doing some research. And still, and this was last year, 2019, still the data shows that the numbers of black people, especially young black men, Mm -hmm. institutionalized for mental illness is disproportionately larger than any ethnicity. So that made me think, okay, there was something in it in 2001 there's got to still be something in it in 2020. What can, we need to start having these conversations and blowing the lid off this and raising awareness because everybody now wants to be woke. And I think yeah. that word is so annoying to me at the moment because everybody's, it's just a, mm-hmm. a bit overused now. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Right? Because I heard it on a call with leadership. At, I was like, huh? And it was like leadership of all white people, by the way. And one of them was like, because they want to be woke. I forgot I was on camera and I burst out laughing. <laughs> and then I had to kind of... I get it, right. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, and it, so it's not as a, to do that. It's a case of, it's time. Yeah. It is time. We can't keep losing our black men to mental illness and if we do lose them to mental illness it's because we did everything we could to try and save right. them first mm-hmm. so that's why i wanted to Aww. have a woman such as yourself that is not just in the field but passionate about the mental health of yes. people mm-hmm. so, nicole dr nicole i should say let me not be rude use my manners <laughs> dr. Nicole Thank you so much for joining me on Conversations with Alice and Jay, the journey to here, to discuss mental health in the black community. 
and your journey to what led you to work in this specific field. So Dr. Kamet, over to you. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, this is a pleasure. One of my favorite topics to talk about. I can go on and on. So you let me know what you want to discuss and I'm here for it. Well, first of all, what led you to being so passionate about working in the field of mental health and, and in recognizing and realizing that Black people especially needed help? Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Like, I think, you know, personally, like, where did I even get the idea that I wanted to go into psychology? And it was a sixth grade teacher. And he actually was white and he was, one day he came to me, he used to like always like teach me stuff or like pull me aside and tell me things um, to help further or make me think about things differently. And he said, I watch you, this is what I'm in school for. He was uh, taking classes uh, in graduate school. And he said, I think you would be really good at this. And before that, I was like, the like most of my friends was like, oh, we're going to be a doctor or a lawyer. And I was like, I'm going to be a lawyer. I'm going to be a juvenile lawyer. Then I was like, oh, actually, I do want to do this. Um, and I, want, I wanted to work with kids. And I went to Howard University for gra uh, undergrad, and it sort of opened up my world. So it opened up my world in terms of, um, what mental health is, what it looks like in the Black community, what are some things we need to consider. And so that's where it really started like, okay, I like this thing. I need to learn more. I need to do more. So I was involved in like psychology clubs and I did all the research programs and like programs where they really help you prepare for graduate school. Um, so I did a summer research opportunity and um, at UCLA and then I was a part of the McNair program at Howard in the career opportunities and research program. And each of these things sort of gave like more information, more exposure to the field. And it sort of showed where, here are the places where we need to learn more. Here, you know, are the places where you have a responsibility. And so I felt like I could make an impact and it interested me. So that was like my beginning um yeah and so what made when did you recognize that the black community needed more help i'm trying to figure out i'm assuming i learned that at howard um because they would have us be a part of like uh the research lab so you would be a part of like studies that they were conducting on campus um, and then those summer research programs and those uh, year-long programs that I was a part of. We also had to do like a senior thesis type of thing where you had to pick a, a subject and sort of research it and prepare it as if you were going into graduate school. And then what ended up happening is the first year after undergrad, I did what they called a um, post-baccalaureate program where you work at the NI, I was at NIH and I, ha I got to work on a research study. And the study was actually, um, it was in the pilot year, but it was um, with a partnership between National Institute of Health and Johns Hopkins, and it was in Baltimore City Schools and um, middle schools. And I gotta be honest, like that, that year was the first year after being at Howard, Mm -hmm. um, there were also people on the team, someone else from Morgan State, and we were like riled up because it was being in a space where these white people were almost looking at the children like animals. And it might feel a little extreme, but when you hear some of the comments and the statements that people make about the children in Baltimore, and you got to think like, wait, they're doing the research, they're like, writing these studies, they're going to do all of this and they're getting this money to understand these kids and they're not protecting them. That was like an eye opener. Like I can't expect someone to protect them the way that I would. Yeah. I have to get my education. Mm. So then that sort of like, okay, that was another thing that fu fueled the fire. Like, okay, it's time to do more. Mm, that's that's interesting and it's interesting that you say that they were viewing the children as yeah because in my mind it's like um so i've done a podcast with 
um, a woman from California, and she helps rescue children that are victims of sex trafficking. Wow. And the way that she told me that social services speak of the children and don't want to help them. So now hearing you from another angle, hearing another group of people talking about children in that way, it's, it's, it's mind-blowing to me that A, people will be seeing children that way. And don't get me wrong, I know that there are just some children that are just <laughs> bad to the bone. Do not, I, know, I just know this. But it's one of those things where because it's a child, you would have thought that they would be maybe a little bit more patient or understanding or just at least try to find out, okay, you're a child. What has happened to you for you to be this way already? Right. And I think a lot of times if you ask that question or if you do a little more research or you understand that this child is a part of all of these systems, how are, you know, how is home? How mm -hmm. is school? How is the community? And you look at it that way, then instead of looking at the child's behaviors as the problem, you mm -hmm. see it as a consequence of the environment. And don't get me wrong, there are lots of things that could be biological or whatever, but I think oftentimes when we're looking at kids in certain environments, it's like, okay, what's happening? And there's been um, studies where they looked at, you know, how do people perceive um, young black children? So looking at both girls and boys and knowing like as little or as early as, I wanna say it might be age five, that they're already viewing black girls as older and mature. And so when you're starting to get that mindset, you don't see the child as being sort of like this behavior is a consequence from the environment, you're looking at them as they're older. So it's like, you're responsible. You should know better. You should do better. It's like, no, 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 no. Give wow. black children that same grace and understanding that all children should have. Mm -hmm. um, but you don't get to, you know, and you think about that, like this was a research study. That's a, a child sex trafficking uh, person who, you know, noticed that. Mm -hmm. But you think about who are all the people that are viewing our children, yeah. how do they view them and what power do they have over their lives? So if you're in a school system, who are the people in that school? How are they viewing them? And how does that determine which kids get suspended, which kids get mediation, which kids get to pass, which kids get access to resources? So those were like, I started out on that study and we like raised hell. <laughs> um, and <laughs> I remember they had like this older man, like I guess he was like distinguished in Baltimore and he was like, sometimes you have to pick your battles. And I remember me and one of the other um, researchers, like the trainees being like, all of this is our battle. Like there isn't a pick. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but by the end, they allowed us to integrate culture and to sort of take over the study and to reach the kids in ways that we could reach, that we felt was more like, applicable to where they were and that they would understand. So being able to use music and history and being able to use words that the kids knew, um, being able to allow them to have talent shows so that the Baltimore kids could show us how they danced and all of these things. And it was like, oh, I want to do this. Mm -hmm. That was like, so even though I feel like there were a lot of challenges, I think it opened my eyes to the disparities and the differences in black mental health, it opened up conversations with the Baltimore community about mistrust of um, these research institutions or people using black people for studies. And it, it just opened up my eyes to so much. So it was like, oh, I'm really gonna do this. Mm. And it's interesting that you say that using um, black people for studies and the research, mm -hmm. because now you're seeing that now they want to start using this COVID vaccine in Africa. Why? Why? That's where all the cases are. And That's not where it started. Exactly. <laughs> okay, why there? So it's, it's interesting that you should say mm -hmm. that. So this is nothing new. Right. And, and going to your point, it's, just, it's a little bit mind-blowing for me. So forgive me. Just, uh, <laughs> just forgive me. But the fact that from the age of five, they were being yes. viewed as older. It's making me think, well, you're seeing them as 
you're older, you should know better, you should be doing better. But at the age of five, how much older could a black child even look? Considering, mm -hmm. considering, it's always saying that we look young for our age. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Right. It's like, wow. So when we're young, we look older, we can handle more, we should be more responsible. We're more, you know, responsible for our behaviors and how you judge. Um, but then when you're older, you don't look your age. It makes no sense, but it just shows like how deep some of these things are, how all of it again impacts our children. But then think about what that does to how a person feels, not just like, um, you know, like I was thinking like how a person functions because it can have implications for school. You can think about it in terms of like how you think about yourself, like your self-esteem. Like if these people are looking down on you and saying you should do better and you're feeling like I'm five, I'm just going to run around and be a kid and I can't pay attention that long. Um, all of those things, like how does that influence them? Because someone in this power position has that thought mm. and so if we expose these types of things and this is where the research studies are important um, because if you expose those types of thoughts if you uh, expose the inaccuracies if you expose these systems that's one thing i like about what's happening right now is i feel like for as much as we've always known it was there it's now being like opened up for everybody but if we can do that but like that's where the change comes into place that's where school systems need to start saying wait we need to change this practice or parents need to start saying okay now i get it i need to get involved because you're not going to treat my child like that or you're holding these people accountable because it does all affect those children those families uh, so yeah yeah and and it's so true because one thing i've often said and and i believe it to be an absolute fact you are a product of your environment Mm -hmm. So therefore, if you're looking and researching and studying a five-year-old, a five-year-old that, you know, more than likely is not raising themselves, right. is not providing for themselves, so therefore that behavior that you're looking at, you're studying, you're researching, is obviously, obviously a learned behavior from somewhere. So and the behaviors they were looking at, it wasn't even necessarily what the kid did. It was the bias of the person. Mm. Just in interpreting, you look at this white kid and you look at this black kid type of thing, like how you're able to explain and understand it for the white kid and see it differently for that black kid, which, I mean, it makes no sense, but yeah that's that is well that is very that's very profound because i had a whole list of questions to ask you but when, <laughs> when the orders went right out of my head like, <laughs> mm -hmm. and it was the same for boys but i can't remember like i need to like look back at it um but it was they also looked at little boys as older as well mm. and mm. Yeah, sometimes i do get it because i remember there was this guy that i grew up with I always thought he was older, but the reason I thought he was older, not because he acted older, just the size of him. Uh-huh. So, you know, so, and you, just the size of him. And I got to know him a few years ago, about 10 years ago, I got to know him. I thought, oh my gosh, you're younger than me. By several <laughs> years younger than me. Yeah. Because he was always so big for his size. You know, I never, and then, you know, because I was young myself as well. So, and it's one thing when you've got an, adult grown person and looking at a child so and it's it's just amazing when you talk about the, the bias yeah as well because something i learned recently um and he's the chief diversity and inclusion officer for a um worldwide law firm he mentioned the term affinity bias mm. recently and i just thought i haven't heard that one yeah Affinity bias. Well, yeah. and um, I'm going to have him on here, so I hope and pray I do this brief explanation of it sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but affinity bias is, for example, in a place of work or in a school, you're going to give that work or you're going to give preferential treatment to the person you have the affinity with. For example, oh. the person that looks like you, the person that sounds like you, the person that's going to come from the same background as you. Yeah. Bias. 
Mm -hmm. And that, so that sounds like that's what it sounds like with yep. Right. Oh. Okay. Did I tell the doctor something new? Yes, you did. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm so taking credit for it, even though I did say that somebody else told me, but I'm so taking credit. But it doesn't matter. You knew it. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah. That's, that's exactly it. Mm -hmm. That's right. You're saying that's exactly it, right? Yeah. My goodness. And so, therefore, so you can see where mm -hmm. the mental illness would start from so young. Right. And where people start to, like, diagnose and label and sometimes what they use to label black kids with may not accurately reflect what that child is really experiencing mm -hmm. so um yeah that's a whole nother yes yes something yes. but it, it's true it's like and it's not to say like you know, all professionals have to be, you know, you think they're, they're going to get it wrong sometimes. I understand that. But understanding also like the biases and the ways that people will sometimes pathologize things in a way that is like, oh, no, that's not what that is. So I think, you know, it's important to understand yourself. What are my biases? What are the things that you know, my experiences, my beliefs, my upbringing, what are those things that's going to influence me in this space? Where are, you know, my biases or lack of knowledge when it comes to this group? Mm -hmm. And then how do I educate myself? Mm -hmm. And so when it does come up in those settings, this phone, like when it does come up in those settings, or if it's triggered or whatever, you're aware of it and you can do something to stop it in that moment. Mm -hmm. But you're also constantly educating yourself so that you don't get caught up in those, you know, places. Oh, of course, of course. Yeah, that's so interesting. So with that being said and that in mind, if we fast forward to adulthood, mm -hmm. what would you say are the biggest challenges facing the Black community when it comes to mental health? Oh, there's so many so you have to um like those kids in that research study for example they grow up to be adults and if their first experiences with someone in the mental health field is not positive they grow up to be adults who have a negative viewpoint on mental health mm -hmm. i think there are personal things such as um access to care like for some communities there are no mental health professionals within that community it may you know it could be like oh it's just a bus ride but for some people that bus ride means a lot or leaving that neighborhood means a lot or you have to be like super invested um at some points to be like okay i'm gonna do this but for some people, there are other factors that get in the way. Um, so being able to get to the services, one could be, how do I pay for it? So there are, I mean, mental health can be expensive. Sometimes you may have access to providers or you may get services, but it may not be the quality of provider that you need. Mm -hmm. um, it may not be someone who has the qualifications that you know, are best to treat what you're presenting. Mm -hmm. um, then there is also the lack of diversity in the field. Like there are black mental health professionals there, you know, it's diverse to an extent, but it's not nearly enough for the people and for um, the need that's out there. So if you think about, we know that relationship is a huge part of it. And the same way you talk about an affinity bias, there are also people who, um, you know, and part of that bias is that you're connecting with someone that you can relate to, whether it's from the upbringing, their, you know, what they look like, their race, where they're from, whatever. We know that for mental health, one of the best predictors of outcomes is the relationship. And mm -hmm. for a lot of people, particularly Black people, they want a provider who looks like them. Yeah. What if I can't get that? What mm -hmm. if I'm in the room and I'm in the room with someone who doesn't understand me? This is going to feel like it doesn't work. It's going to feel like this is for them and not me. And I'm going to stop treatment. So those are some of the things. But then other factors that come in is like just thinking of the stigma of mental health. What does it mean to go to a mental health provider? I think that 
is like changing with this newer generation, just hearing kids talk about therapists and I have anxiety and they talk about it so freely. <laughs> but like for some adults and older adults is like, you know, that idea of needing someone, yeah. it, it, it's terrifying. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's showing a vulnerability that some black people just may not want to go there. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not familiar with it either. You're not familiar with it. As black people, it's, it's long been said that like, we're not allowed to be vulnerable. We're not allowed to show vulnerability. It's almost as though it's unheard of. It's like, you, you know that we're people, right? That's exactly right. Emotions too. Yeah, wow. That's, that's exactly it, right? Like we, part of what we know is like, you know, people always say this for black people, like, you're so strong. You, you know, with your history and with your ancestors, you, you got strength. You can't like cry. And it's like, I can't be human. I can't say that this hurt. Yeah. Right. I can't feel. And so that's a part of it. And then the other part of that is, if I show that vulnerability, if I go to seek help, historically, what has happened? Have the people who displayed and shown this vulnerability, has that vulnerability been protected? Mm. And so it sends the message maybe that it's not safe to be vulnerable. It's not safe to open it up. You need to deal with this internally because black people will always, I, I remember when we were starting out, it's like, don't talk to them about anything. We don't want anyone taking our kids. And it's like, we're not taking your kids, but there was just this like shutdown. Yeah, so yeah. I think there are so many factors that get in the way. Um, I think education is a big part, just meaning that the mental health field is not based on black people. Mm -hmm. And I think there are people who are changing that, right? But if you think about the theories, the approaches, you know, how it was established. It was not about Black people. And so um, that in itself, when you're talking about the symptoms, when you're talking about the criteria for a diagnosis, who is that based on? Because if you look at the symptoms for anxiety disorder or depression, it may not always look the same way that someone of color may experience it. Mm. And so it might feel like, well, that's not me. Mm -hmm. I don't need to deal with that. And so that's, you know, it's, it's so many things. And I think that going back to your point about um, seeing more Black people in like an inpatient facility, we know that because of all of these factors that Black people are less likely to go to treatment and seek that help in those earlier stages. Wow. It's not until the symptoms are more severe that it's like, oh, I can't handle this. Now something must be wrong. And then now you're looking at a different course of treatment. And, um, and it's something you said, and, and the fact that I loved, and I loved not because of the subject matter, I loved because you pretty much described an experience I had. Where, mm. <laughs> where, so, and again, what I shouldn't love, but um, <laughs> it's, um, the experience that I had was, so I, thank God, had a failed suicide attempt. Mm -hmm. And um, so, um, yeah, the failed suicide attempt. And one of the things that I had to agree to was I was going to see a therapist. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to see a therapist because as far as I was concerned, yeah, I did it. It didn't work. Just keep mm -hmm. it moving. So I went to see, the first person I went to see was a woman, was a, a, a white lady. She seemed pleasant enough. Mm -hmm. I remember I walked in there and it was your stereotypical setting that you see in the movies. She had a desk, with a box of tissues, the couch. And I'm thinking to myself, if you think I'm going to be in here crying, boo-hoo him, you have a completely another thing coming. Now, my parents are Jamaican. Mm -hmm. So you know that whole, don't tell nobody your business, don't talk. And then not only that, it's the whole, um, the whole, oh God, they're mad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and growing up, there was a place, there was a mental, um, mental um, institution, a hospital, and it was called Shenley. 
Mm-hmm. So you started acting any kind of way, and it was a uh, careful, you know, because I'm going to take you to Shenley and leave you. Oh, yes, yes, yes. The <laughs> fear of God was now putting in. Yes. That is such a good point. Oh my goodness. How many places? It's like you always have a place where it's like, oh, you need to go to, you know, yeah. Oh right. My so goodness. it's just like fix up because, so you know, I've, so now I've got all of this in my head. But that now, so they want me to go and see this person. So I, went, I walk in there and um, I sit down. The first thing she says to me is, so what's the relationship like with your parents? Have you ever seen that gif of Viola Davis where she does this? Uh-huh. Walker, uh-huh. That was me. That, that was it. That was me. There was no introduction, no nothing. What are we, this is what we're going to do. Why do you feel you're here? Nothing. It was just straight to, I'm just like, mm. um, at that time, my history with my parents was, don't know my father, was not having a great relationship with my mother, yeah and that's what you're gonna yeah and i just had a first suicide attempt that's it oh and i don't know you so you know it was literally that (laughs) (laughs) and so so then obviously because she had to write the report that i just got up and walked out and never came back i had to go and see another one so i went to see another one and so this is more to your point of what you were saying about you're not here for me. You just don't know, understand. It didn't look like me. I couldn't identify with you. And there's no way that this man could identify with me. So it was a, um, uh, a white man, an older white man. And you could tell he was like very, one of those very square white mm-hmm. men. Because he was wearing like a V-neck sweater. Um, and you know, the back, back in the day, like, so we're talking about what? the 90s mm-hmm. you know like the sweaters that we're wearing now was, you know when you see those ones with the sweater mm-hmm. and he had a hearing aid in both ears and i kid you not i still can picture the man and he sat there and this was not quite the nice comfy place like the last one this was a bit more low budget because <laughs> <laughs> you know you know like they had like the classroom chairs not even any little uh-huh. chairs kind of thing so I sat in one chair, he sat opposite me in a chair. And you know, the truth of the matter is, I don't even remember what the man's voice sounded like. He's like, so talk to me about yourself. So I started to, I'm like, all right then, I'm gonna give this a shot. Cause like, Alison, obviously yeah. there's something going on while you attempted suicide, give it a shot. So I told him just a little portion, nothing much. And the way he sat there like this man was completely enthralled and completely enraptured and fascinated by what I was saying in my life. So you know what I did? <laughs> Every time I went there, I told him any old BS. <laughs> anything, told him anything, anything. And even something like I may have seen something in a movie or something. So I yes. him, Because looking at him, and I know I was judging, but I was young and didn't know much better. Looking at him, I knew whatever movie I was going to be telling her about, there was no zero chance that this man had ever seen that movie. <laughs> so I'm sitting there just like, and I'm like, yeah, and I did this, and we did this, and we went here, and he was just sitting there like, mm-hmm. and I'm thinking, to, and he didn't offer anything back to me. Yeah. He just listened. So I went for about three sessions and telling this man, all anything that I felt like, whether it's a movie I watched, something I read in a magazine, anything, didn't offer me any any kind of positive steps, help, or anything. Wow. The three sessions, and I must admit, it's like I actually got bored. I'm like, you know what, this is boring now. I can't think of anything more to tell you because obviously there's no point in me telling you about me because you haven't even realized I'm not telling you about me. You haven't even realized that you have not even picked that up. So, mm-hmm. he, you know, again, didn't look like me. And maybe it was that whole affinity bias for me. But deep down, I don't think it was that. I just think that you could not identify with what I was saying to you. You can't identify with any aspect or area of my life. So how can you even begin to help me? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's like, it's hard. I don't know. Well, I don't think it's that hard. I think that... Um, these are conversations that are coming up, you know, on the job about 
how do you work with someone who's of a different race, believes sexual orientation, identifies differently from you in some capacity? And for some reason, when it comes to like race, ethnicity, people get uncomfortable. And I always say, what do you do if the person um, is gay and you're not gay? You, there's still a way that you ask questions, that you're invested, that you care, mm -hmm. that you show that person that you want to learn about them. So I am by far not like, and I feel like these things are always evolving. So it's not just because I'm a black woman, I understand all black people. We all have different experiences. We are such a diverse group of people. You're thinking about age and generations and geographically where people live and like whatever life experiences, beliefs. Mm -hmm. There is so much diversity in black people. So there's no way I can know all of that. But yeah. what I will do is when I'm in that space, I'm going to create a space where you feel safe. Yeah. where you feel heard, where if there is something that I don't understand, I'm going to ask you the questions. I'm going to do my own due diligence and educate myself and attend trainings and conferences and all of those things, read books. And I, you know, it's something that I listen to people. And then if there are certain words or things that they say, it's important to me, I'm going to use that in the session so that it feels like you. So if you tell me, you know, you, you use certain words or if you talk about church or if you talk about a scripture, then when I'm talking to you, I'm going to use that with you so that it feels like this person hears me. And I'm not just doing that as like a trick. I really care. And I feel like that there are other providers, like if you take that, those steps and we're constantly learning and whatever else, like maybe therapy, even if you're not black, you can still reach and make an impact on black mental health, you know? Mm. Yeah, that is, that is good. That is good. Mm -hmm. And I like that because one of the things that I've learned recently is many times people don't listen to understand, they listen to respond. Mm -hmm. So with you as the therapist, and you're list and you're repeating something to them, then you're not just listening to me to respond. You're listening to me to understand me. To under that mm -hmm. builds that connection and makes me want to then share more with you and open up more with you. Because one of the things that people I think are not realizing is me coming to you is not for your good. It's for mine. Yeah, but what black i feel like what and you know this sort of led to um something that i experienced when i first was like like same as you like i had the idea of this is what black mental wellness needs to be mm -hmm. there is also a space where i know that for many black people there when they come to session there are some people who are going to be open on that first session because it maybe they've been in therapy before maybe they've held it in for so long that they just need a release mm -hmm. but there are some people where it's not a test i think it's just about or maybe it's a test i don't know but it's just about how do i know i'm comfortable enough with this person to mm -hmm. share this like vulnerable thing that I have not shared with anyone else. Mm. And part of doing that is just building rapport and trust. And so people might feel like in the beginning of therapy, like I'm wasting my time. I'm not really talking about what I need to, but also understand that all of those sessions, maybe it's helping you build up to communicate about it. Maybe it's helping you to understand what therapy feels like. Maybe it's, it's helping you feel more comfortable with your therapist. And that eventually people do open up, you know, they do start to feel comfortable. They do start to disclose and talk about these things. And when you have that experience and you don't feel judged for it and you feel that that person heard you and respects you and will protect what you said, because we do have confidentiality, like that is a gift to black people, in my opinion. Because we just said, where do you go that you can have that vulnerability? <clears throat> Hopefully, we're getting that more. But I just feel like we need more spaces like that. And therapy can be that when it works properly. Mm, when it works properly. That, that. Yeah. So, so thinking about 
what we were saying about the number of black people affected by mental health issues. Mm. In your professional opinion and, and what you've seen over your years, what would you say that some of the causes that contribute to the disproportionate numbers of black people suffering from mental health issues? Yeah, I think it's like, I mean, we can go on and on about like, I, I do want black people to understand that there are some genetic aspects to mental health, mm -hmm. to mental illness, right? So a lot of times we may have used different words in our community, depending on where you're from. But people say things like, um, she got bad nerves. That's anxiety. Okay. So if you got bad nerves and your mama had bad nerves and your grandma had bad nerves, that's showing a little bit of like, genetically, there might be some aspects where this is passed down. The same way we would think about, you know, for some people, heart disease or diabetes or whatever. Like it's the same, it's a, there can be a biological aspect to it. Mm -hmm. There can be environmental factors, right? Like um, if you, let's think about if you work in a high stress environment that um, creates that sense of urgency or perfectionism, or you can't make a mistake or all of these things, then maybe there are some aspects where you start to feel worried about that, or you start to um, get worried in other places. So there can be some genetic pieces. There can be some environmental things. We also know, like if you look at poverty, the impact that that has on mental health. If you look at, um, if you're thinking of like low income communities. So then you're thinking about like, you know, parental stress and what that looks like. We think about trauma. Um, so just having traumatic experiences. And sometimes it's not just like that one traumatic experience. It could be multiple. So if you were to think about you know, what do you see in your community? Do you know someone who was shot, who was robbed? Do you know someone who was killed? Do you have a parent in jail? Like you're starting to like think about the, that all of these factors are compounded. Mm -hmm. When you think about um, even like racism and discrimination, like people think about it as like this one event, but it's not. It's related to these differences we see in communities. It's related to the differences in resources that we see differences in pay, differences in types of jobs and education, and then housing, like where, how you are treated by a medical provider, how they interpret Black people at times as it relates to like pain and all of that. So you have all of these things that are impacting what you might see in that therapy room. Um, so yeah, it, it, it can, and it can be a combination of things. And a lot of times like when I first went to graduate school, I wanted to study resilience because I didn't understand like how can people come from the same community and have totally different outcomes? Mm. How are there some people who sort of give in to that way of life and living? And then there are some people who say, oh, there's no way that I'm you know, going to have a life like this. I need to change things. Um, and so just thinking like there's so many factors. That's where you start to think about um the genetic component but also what are all of those experiences environmental things that can change that so it's a range and those we always talk about mental illness um we think about like the norm you know the most common like depression anxiety trauma when you're looking at kids you think about adhd or social anxiety but when you're starting to think about like something that's more severe like schizophrenia um, bipolar disorder, uh, you think about people who have like a psychotic episode, like those are things where it's like there could be multiple factors that contribute to it. Um, yeah, yeah cause, um, the couple of experiences that I know, so like I said about the young man that I dated um, all those years ago, his came about because as a young black man, he used to smoke weed. Uh huh. And he asked his friend to build him a spliff or roll him a joint. And um, the the person did it, laced it with LSD and didn't talk. Yes. So he had such a bad trip from it. That chemical imbalance in his brain left him with a diagnosis of bipolar disorder, um, otherwise known as manic depression. Right. And I'll say this, like they, you know, it's, it's one of those like warnings with drugs, right? Because it could be someone else could take that. They could have smoked with him. 
and had nothing. Mm. Like absolutely nothing. And some of those things could be like underlying conditions that are triggered by that drug and that chemical response. That's good too. And so you may, and for some people, they have those, you know, those breaks and then they like get treatment and they're okay. Mm -hmm. For some people, that's a lasting consequence. And so that is one of those things where it's like, um, you're taking a risk because you don't know. Yeah. But substance use is another one of those areas where it's like, that could be related to environmental, it could be related to mental health, because a lot of times as you talk to people and you understand like what were the things that led to that substance use to begin with, like, oh, this was used as a way to escape, to avoid, to like not want to feel, yeah. And, it, and it's, I didn't even think of that, a trigger for an underlying condition. Yeah. Never even thought of that in all these years. Yeah. It was just the case of, we just said, oh, he was fine. He smoked this. He wasn't. He's not fine. Yeah. And, and the person that he smoked it with, like you said, absolutely. Nothing. Right. It's and like, cool. yeah. So, so that actually could absolutely explain everything. And to the other point you were making, um, my family had um, went through a serious incident last year where um, a family member was, um, she was put in an environment where she was remembering abuse that happened when she was a child. Mm -hmm. So then she started to have um, post-traumatic stress disorder, mm -hmm. but nobody realized that. So I remember when I got home from work, I remember I said to them, uh-uh, no, 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 mm -mm. we're calling, calling, call an ambulance. Oh. I said, she's having a psychotic break because I had seen it when I dated that guy. Uh -huh. And they're like, oh, no, 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 because she was only over here visiting on vacation. And so, and then her behavior would start to become more and more irrational, more and more mm -hmm. erratic. And she was saying things and, and it was just like, okay, is it, is Am I the only person? Because there was yeah. four, five of us in the house at the time. And I'm like, um, I, you all have been here all day. I've just walked in from work. Am I the only person hearing this? Are you all right. not hearing this? And, and then um, fast forward, she ended up attacking my mother. It's quite seriously. My mum ended up in hospital for a week after that. And obviously then it was a case of police called ambulance yep. and, and all the rest of it and she actually was baker acting for those of you in the uk that section she was section but she but when they caught her she was baker acting and i remember when the police the sheriff's office called me after they found her no they didn't call she no the only number she could remember was her uncle in england so they called the uncle in England. The uncle then called me in, because I was in Florida at the time, gave me the number for the sheriff's office. I called the sheriff's office and they were they saying to me that she was completely out of her mind. Mm -hmm. Completely. They had to sedate her at the scene. Mm -hmm. And they ended up Baker acting her. So to your point of, a, something traumatic happening to a person because up until then she was um, in her mid-20s when this happened up until then perfect child yeah nothing so so to your point about an under something underlying and just that's just just the memory of going back into that home after something like 17 <laughs> years just triggered mm -hmm. and in the space of not even 12 hours it's probably i think it was in the space of eight hours how it just spirals so out of control and she just completely and this is um almost a year and a half later she's still not the same wow yeah trauma is it's hard and you you never know what those triggers may be where they may you know remind this person of what they experienced and what they you know like mm -hmm. how they feel from it and a lot of times um people block things out you suppress it it's like your body's way of protecting you mm -hmm. and so when it comes up you don't always know how that may look so trauma is yes yeah, it's, it's a hard one that's right 
it's it so so as you're saying that it's okay you know the underlying mm -hmm. because she had obviously suppressed what had happened to her for so long and then and because it was 17 years between it happening and her walking back into that home yeah and the way that that triggered so it's and i don't think a lot of people realize that that it I mean, maybe as a child, because you don't have that outlet, don't know who to say, especially because the person that abused her was a family member. Mm -hmm. So you may not have, be able to share it or say, but as an adult, having gone through a traumatic event, I don't think people realize the importance of seeking help and not bottling it up. Because if you don't deal with it, it's just going to come up in an ugly way. It's, it's, it's going to come. Down the line. And you can't, could predict or control when that's going when that's going to come one thing i work with veterans currently and one thing that i tell them because they always have the question of like i experienced that this long ago like and it, it could be like the most random thing now we'll just take them back mm -hmm. and then the thoughts start coming and now they're you know it, it like grows and i tell people like you know trauma it's like you think of it it's like always beneath the surface mm -hmm. it's just there and that it can take what might feel like this minor event, but to you, that person is like, you just got under that surface a little bit and now it's there. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you're either gonna deal with that trauma or it's gonna deal with you. So how do you face it so that it doesn't have that power and control over how you live? That is, that is good, that is good. And, and that's one of the things I would really wish I could drive home to people, deal with the trauma deal with it deal with the trauma mm -hmm. because like you said and i like that if you don't deal with the trauma the trauma is going to deal with you yeah it controls your relationships how you feel how you respond how you act how you you know it can come up in so many different ways and you know so as a mental health professional what do you think we could do to just basically to safeguard our own mental health because mm -hmm. a lot of it is the truth is we can't rely on somebody else to protect our mental health it starts with us with us so what yeah. can we do i will okay i'm gonna we're gonna go through this because i think you you hit it it starts with us mm -hmm. and it starts with you know how you are in your home so i will take you as an individual start with what are those things that helps you feel whole grounded happy mm. who you know what are your releases who are the people that you feel connected to what are your beliefs or those things you tap into to get like rejuvenated or reset who are what are your yeah we'll start there so i always encourage people to like you know what are, do you you know is faith or spirituality important to you i always ask that question if they say yes okay what are the things mm. because if it's prayer we're gonna add this to the list if it's going to church if it's listening to music if it's you know having this meditative period and talking to god in that way we're adding that to your you need almost like a toolkit mm -hmm. um, i talk to people about like exercise you know it's like the 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 health things but health and mental health are so intertwined and so you got to think about your sleep you mm -hmm. think about what you eat you think about exercise Add all of those to the equation. Other things that I encourage more Black people to do is like, I always ask, have you tried meditation? Um, are you willing to try? Okay, you don't want to do meditation. How about some deep breathing? How about, I need you. Yes, it's like, I need you to have those quiet moments and that space to yourself so that you're even sitting still to know what you're thinking or feeling. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we're on go so much that we're not even in tuned with what we're feeling or thinking. And I feel like when the pandemic first hit, a lot of people had a chance to slow down. You were forced into it and you only had to deal with yourself. Mm -hmm. So I encourage people to have those quiet moments, do things like journal and not in like a dear John type of way, but more like, Put your thoughts on paper, put your feelings on paper. If there are things that are happening in your life, have that release in that way. Um, and then think about who are those people that you can connect to. So um, if there are people, friends, family, coworkers, groups that you're a part of, 
that helps you feel like happy or you feel connected to someone, people that you can trust and talk to and have those vulnerable moments with. And then I would also encourage people, the last part would just be like activities, like what helps you? So if you like to go hiking, add that to your list. If you want to go gardening, do it. If you like to sing or dance, but the reason I'm saying this is because mental health is not just going to therapy. It's all of those things. Yes, you yes. know, you think about your finances. How are you doing with that? Do you need to, you know, work on paying off your bills or your debt? Because all of those things impact how you feel. And that's what we can do. So I think we start with ourselves. And then if you have children, provide that framework for them. Allow your children a safe space to express their feelings, a safe place to come to you and talk about things that might feel difficult without shutting them down. And when they come to you with those feelings and emotions, help them figure out how do you cope with it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We are no longer shutting our kids out. We are no longer passing on the, um, you know, keep that to yourself. Like, no, we are dealing with our stuff because we are gonna change how we deal with our health in the black community. And that is so vitally important, like you're saying, having a toolkit. And that's one of the things I wanted to actually touch on you now that people are, during the pandemic, during this time, that people aren't able to get out. So for example, if you've got people that live on their own and they're not able to go out and meet people, or like one of the things you mentioned, go to church, um, what would you say to that person to help keep them from going a little bit stir crazy? Yeah, what I've been sharing is like, it may not feel the same, but you still have to be intentional about connecting with people. So if you, if church is important to you, be a part of your church's virtual services. Right, right. Call somebody from your church and watch it together if you need to. So you can feel like I'm not in this by myself. Mm -hmm. If your family lives in a different place, mm -hmm. FaceTime or video chat your family, call them, be intentional. They have so many ways that you can do like activities virtually. For myself, my family is all in one place. I'm in another place. Mm -hmm. My aunt myself, my daughter and my aunt started doing cooking lessons. Oh. So virtual cooking lessons where it didn't feel like we were just limited to, hey, how you doing? What's going on? It was actually like quality time because you're teaching me family recipes and I'm doing it with my daughter and we're able to recreate and bring a piece of home. Mm -hmm. So you just have to get more um, creative about it. Um, but those connections are still important. Right, right, right. And that is, that is key. And that is good because we do need that because mm -hmm. we don't know how long this is, this is going to We last. don't know. Yeah. We don't know if it's going to come around again and we have to maybe shut down for six months every summer. <laughs> we have no idea. You know, even though I would rather that we shut down in the winter, we said I don't know. Yes. So we can enjoy. Exactly. Put that out there. But um, we just have to start with taking care of ourselves and making, being intentional. Mm -hmm. about it and not taking care of everybody else, everybody else's mental health and, and neglecting ourselves. That's right. Yeah. That's interesting. So lastly, I'd like to ask you, in an ideal world, as a mental health professional, what would you like to see? Yeah, I would like to see people like mental health being more normalized mm -hmm. to where it's not um, this huge stigma that makes it scary for people to get treatment mm -hmm. to where the same way we go to the dentist, we go to the doctor, we go get our hair done, our nails and pedicures that we have these mental health checkups. Mm -hmm. How are you doing? How are you feeling? What do you need to tune up? Mm -hmm. And people being okay with that, but also that they have the access to it. Like we truly need to make it more accessible to people in a way that is affordable, that it's in their neighborhood, that it feels familiar. And I really would love that mental health continues to grow in the area of providing culturally informed services mm -hmm. so that we really consider not just this. Um, individual or this, you know, sort of 
diagnostic manual as one tool, but that we look at all of these cultural aspects and then determine, well, what's the best approach to treating this? Mm. That's good. That's good. Dr. Nicole Cannon, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. This You're is very great. Welcome. Thank you. And I could be here talking to you all day. Yeah. <laughs> I absolutely could because there's so many things that I'm just thinking mm -hmm. we can unpack this and unpack that because we we need to do that. We need to start somewhere. And mm -hmm. the black community needs as much help as possible. Yes. With our mental health. So thank yes. you for the work that you're doing. And um, so let please let our listeners know where can they find you? Yeah, so um, I am the president and one of the founding members of Black Mental Wellness, and we are a corporation of four licensed clinical psychologists, all Black women, um, and we are so, so, so passionate about Black mental health, and so we have a website, um, blackmentalwellness.com. We're on Instagram, at Black Mental Wellness, Facebook, at Black Mental Wellness, Twitter, at Wellness Black, um, but we have a ton of resources that are free on our website so you can find information about mental health from a black perspective what symptoms might look like for you what are some things that come up in the black community specific to being black and mental health we have coping and wellness resources information about podcasts and videos and so much more um, that's free because it's important to educate people um, we do have like a training program where we uh, have trainees nationally because we want to change and prepare students for graduate school so that we can have more diverse uh, behavioral health, mental health professionals. Um, and then we do lots of other things, trainings and workshops and so much more. So we are busy, but you know, it's important to us. So please reach out on our website or on social media. We're always putting out content on social media. Great, thank you. So everybody now knows where they can find you all. So thank you so much for that. Dr. Thank Nicole, you. thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Take care now. <laughs>